Okay, the body of Okay, I see we have some extra participants. This is for employment. One, everybody who's in attendance, right? Um, good morning, yes. Okay. Okay. Let me um, take the register, please. You can give me your names, please. Kendra Mark. Uh -huh. Tadashi Palacios. Mm -hmm. Catherine Zerbos. Tora Shanice. Fortune. Shanice McDonald. Nikita Isaacs. Sherlyn Hunt. Bridget Roll. Marsha Lightborn. Jamia Joseph. That's everyone. Siobhan Linden. Okay. Bridget Roll. Okay, Bridget Roll. Sierra Novo is having technical difficulties. She should also be in this class. What's the name? Sorry. Sierra Novo. Sierra Novo. Z or S? C. C. C E R A. Okay, so she's coming in. I see a G Smith. That's Glenicia Smith. Okay, she she she's there. Her. Okay, then let me put her down. Okay, so just so, uh, so I have everyone, K. Martin, T. Palacios, C. Zervos, T. Fortune, C. McDonald, N. Isaacs, S. Hunt, B. Roll, M. Lightborn, J. Joseph, C. Linden, Z. DeVoe, and G. Smith. I've not missed anyone, eh? No. Excellent. I sent an email, I don't know if you received it, last night. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Excellent. Okay, so that was just a recap of our literal um, golden and mischief rule. Now, just a recap. Um, everyone remembers what the ratio is in a case? Binding precedent. It's the binding precedent. So what that means for me if I use the ratio, the ratio of a case? Um, the decision that was made in a prior case that binds the lower courts. So it, it 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 means it's a court that's what a higher court. It's, the, yeah, so it's it's a court. Um, so then the lower court is what? What the uh, lower court has to do? I'm sorry. What the lower court has to do? The lower they're bound. Court. They're bound to follow that decision. And but, what is that called? Uh, first precedent. Court? First there. instance court. They are decisors. Yes, they are decisors. Yes. So what about if I um, use a binding precedent in a case, however, the facts are a little different. What um, then the court will say? Um, you're those is distinct. You must distinguish. Yes, yeah, so we have a distinct, right, it's distinguishing because the facts are similar but not the same, eh? So the principle, We'll come to a different decision from the earlier case. What about persuasive precedent? How does that work? The, the, low, the later court's decision, you don't have to follow it. You're still able to make a decision. Right, so what that does, it just gives us what? Influence. Yeah, so it's more or less. It just tells us more or less what happened before and the judge may be able to use it to, it may be used to persuade the judge to follow what 
what um, you're trying to guide them toward, eh, more or less. So it, give me an example of what will be used. Some examples of persuasive precedent. The obedient dictum. Yes, obedient dictum is one. And then the decisions of the lower court, courts of equal authority or courts of the Commonwealth jurisdiction. Who's the, um, what is the highest court in the Bahamas, within the Bahamas? Privy Council. Within the Bahamas. Court of Appeal. Court of, Court of Appeal. Appeal. And outside, like Mr. Fortune said. Privy Council. Privy right. Council. Privy <laughs> Council. Okay. Um, what, give me um, two sources of Bahamian law. Constitution. Constitution and the Bahamian case law. Okay. And equity. Okay. And what about, um, give me an example of, or tell me more or less what happens with, um, what the mischief rule is all about. Just a brief touch. Um, that one is where the judge decides to, I guess, stray from the literal or the golden rule. But what they do? What, they what happens? <clears throat> they try to, to cure whatever, I guess, fault may be in that law. They send it back to parliament. So what they are doing is they now say, what, what was the purpose of this statute or act? It, its purpose, they enunciate the purpose and say what it was intended to cure, whatever mischief was there. Now, this law has come to remedy that mischief, right? If there's a mischief created, what they would then do? Make recommendations, eh? And you, like Ms. Isaac said, what they'll do? They send it back to Parliament for the right. amendment. So, me sending back to Parliament. So, what 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 may happen now? We will create a what? Subsidiary legislation. Right. And so, this how this how it comes about? How legislation comes about? We have first what? First reading. Good. We, what we do? What we get first? You draft it first, then you have your first reading. Okay, so the draft is what? What we call it before it's in a the bill. Right, we draft in a bill. Then what happens? What's the next stage? You prepare the white paper or the green paper. Uh huh. And then we have public, a public publication, public consultation, really? more or less. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what and then it goes where? And then it goes to it is introduced. Uh, introduced in the House of Assembly. Right. It's introduced in the House of Assembly. What happens thereafter? Give me the stages now. Second, Second reading. We we ain't had the first reading yet. We introduce it. Oh. So the first reading is where it's tabled. Yes. Table the first reading. Yes, then it goes to the second reading. Second reading. Uh huh. The committee stage. Uh huh. Report, Report stage. Next. Third reading. Uh huh. The Senate. The Senate. And finally, the Okay. So anybody was able to find out anything for me this week? Um, well, the closest I heard, about, um, the closest thing I heard about a bill or anything close to a bill was on the 17th when they made reference to the marijuana legislation. That was the closest I heard. So that's a, where, where, what stage this legislation at now? Right now, that's still in the in the conversation stage. So I don't even know where that fit in. So that's just like a pu in public domain. They testing it out now, eh? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna get on the feedback to know where whether or not 
they can introduce a bill. So they, they gather an information. So they may be creating white papers or, or green papers or what or the like. Eh? That was the only thing I heard closest to reference to anything about a bill or legislation. Yes. Okay. So we gotta we must look at that then. That's something we could be looking at without an atmosphere or anything else would may come up, eh? We have five, five, we have four weeks left, including this one now. Now, who's the president of the Court of Appeal? Sir Michael Barnett, the honorable Sir, Sir Michael Barnett. Okay, we could fill that in on our book now, eh? And take yeah. out the wrong thing. Who are the justices of appeal? Um, the Honorable, the Honorable Mr. Justice. Uh-huh. Um, this morning. Uh-huh. The Honorable Mr. Justice Roy Jones. Jones. Okay. Justice Milton. What's the name? Sorry. Milton, Justice Milton Evans. Excellent. Okay, go ahead. And Madam Matthew. Justice Carolina Bethel. Okay. Anyone else? Oh, that was all I saw. That's it? Okay. That's it. That's it. Who's the registrar? Sharada Ferguson. Okay. And the deputy registrar? Ingrid, Ingrid Cooper Brooks. She's still the registrar there? Pardon the information? Yeah. Well, you all called? I think it may be Ronaldo too. Good morning. Good morning. This is at um, the Court of Appeal now. Oh, okay, okay. I see um, that Ingrid Cooper Brooks is the Vice President in the Industrial Tribunal now. Did y'all call or no? Oh. No? No. Mm. I thought this was our little homework we were gonna do. When we, when we call, they, they, I mean, when I call, they directed us straight to the website. Wow. Okay. Then. Myself as well. Okay. Right. And the website has Ingrid Cooper Brooks. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just check because I saw her sitting in the industrial tribunal. So I don't know if she's playing a dual role. Okay, then. So we had an uh, overview of module one for those who weren't in attendance last week. Hopefully that will give you a little um, snippet of what we did last week. Um, any questions from last week or the information was sufficient for you all um, breaking down the little rule, the mischief and the golden? That was good for you? Yes. Excellent. Okay, for module two, we're doing the Bahamas Industrial Tribunal. And after completing this module, we should be able to define an industrial tribunal, an employment tribunal, gain an awareness and appreciation of the, of the quasi judicial and process, develop in depth knowledge of the rules and procedures of the Bahamas Industrial Tribunal, understand the workings of the Bahamas Industrial Tribunal, and gain knowledge of the appeals process for appeals to the Supreme Court and Court of Appeal from decisions of the Bahamas Industrial Tribunal. Okay, who's gonna start for us last week? We might as well use the new persons, eh? Because we had um, um, go from there. Okay, El Stewart says to everyone that Ingrid Cooper Books is acting. That's what you're saying, um, Ms. Stewart? Good morning. Um, Good morning. Information is that it's Christina Wallace Whitfield acting. Okay, okay that's it. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Stewart, do you think you could help us out with beginning our reading today, or are you? It's fine. You okay? Thank you. The Bahamas Industrial Tribunal, that's where we're going to start? No, the quasi-judicial the quasi -judicial process. Okay. The quasi-judicial process. The quasi-judicial process is less formal than the judicial process in terms of the requirements of evidence and standard of proof required for legal matters. The standard of proof for criminal matters is beyond a reasonable doubt and for civil matters on balance of probabilities. In the quasi-judicial process, the standard of proof required 
is on balance of probabilities, which a lesser standard in terms of proving a case against the defending party. Administrative tribunals are special bodies which have been established by an act of parliament to deal with certain legal disputes between the government and the person or group of persons, a legal entity, example, the judicial review. Domestic tribunals are disciplinary committees for professional bodies which are regulated and may be established under statute. Industrial reg relations tribunals are quasi-judicial bodies established to hear and determine matters of employment or an industrial nature. They have legal powers to enforce rulings and ensure that certain actions are taken or legal remedies are made. Employment tribunals are originally established in the United Kingdom as industrial tribunals in the early 1960s, which dealt with tra training levy complaints and then included unfair dismissal complaints in the early 1970s. The industrial tribunals in the UK were formally renamed employment tribunals in the late 1970s and their jurisdictions, jurisdiction, sorry, extended beyond standard industrial matters to matters involving employment rights, including but not limited to equal pay, maternity benefits, right of trade union membership, and racial, sexual, and disability discrimination rights. These employment tribunals are governed by the Employment Tribunals Act of 1996 and the Employment Tribunals Constitution and Rules of Procedure Regulations 2004 as amended in the UK. Okay, so let's stop right there. Um, the quasi-judicial process, which is a less um, formal process than the judicial process. So with the quick, anything that's quasi is not um, completely what the name is. So we have quasi government corporations and we have government corporations. So the quasi process means it doesn't follow it um, the rules so rigidly. So in the process of, um, in the judiciary or in the criminal side, we, evidence and standard of proof is for criminal matters beyond a reasonable doubt and for civil matters on the balance of probabilities. In this quasi-judicial process, the, sta the standard of proof is on the balance of probabilities, but it's a lesser standard in terms of proving a case against um, the defendant party. So they may allow certain things to take place that wouldn't normally um, follow in a judicial process. They may consider more things than would happen in the judicial process. So it's not as rigid. They are the bodies of these um, quasi-judicial um, tribunals, more or less, are established by an act of parliament, and they deal with legal disputes between the government and um, persons or a group of persons. So in the example of judicial review, you'll have where I have a, um, a grievance where I felt like um, my constitutional right or my rights as an employee were not um, followed. And so the government has created or they've created acts. There's acts of parliament to deal with certain situations of that nature. So I can ask for a judicial review of a decision that was made where I was working for a government agency and I felt like I was unfairly treated or my rights were not, were trampled on more or less. So in this instance, we're referring to a quasi-judicial body is that of our industrial tribunals. And they are established to hear matters of employment or of an industrial nature. Whilst they have um, legal powers, um, they can enforce their rulings or to ensure that certain legal remedies are made. We'll find out that where there is an enforcement because as much as they give ruling, sometimes it may need to be enforced elsewhere because they're not, um, it's not as punitive as it would be in a Supreme Court action. So we'll find that out later on. These tribunals originate um, out of United Kingdom where they were established in the 1960s and they deal with 
um, training um, levy complaints, and then they included the unfair dismissal. So you'd find in our industrial tribunal here, it deals more particularly with employment matters, and it's a very um, active court in this um, in the Bahamas, in particular, um, Nassau centric. So we have the industrial tribunal where we have a president and vice president, and um, they refer to as judges now. Um, here of late, they're not no longer just referred to as the president and vice president. They have them as justices as well now. Um, these employment um, tribunals are, are governed by the Employment Tribunals 1996 and um, Act and the Employment Tribunal Constitution and Rules of Procedure Regulations 2004 Act. That's as far as the UK is concerned. In our jurisdiction, um, what act do we have that would govern them? We have the Industrial Relations Act, okay? Yes? You all remember the acts from last week? Anyone? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we have Bahamas Industrial Tribunal, so we can... Um, particularly associate that, that's an easy one because we have a common root word, eh? industrial. So that's the Industrial Relations Act. Would, we'd be guided by the Industrial Relations Act. Any questions on the quasi-judicial process? Okay, let's continue. The Bahamas Industrial Tribunal. The Bahamas Industrial Tri the Bahamas established the Industrial Relations Board in 1970. The board was enacted pursuant to the Industrial Relations Act of 1970. Its purpose was one, hear all disputes relative to essential services referred by the Minister of Labor, two, to register industrial agreements, and three, to hear any matters relative to the registration of such agreements. The act was later amended in 1970 to establish the arbitration tribunal to hear all disputes relative to non-essential services. The hearing of essential services remained with the Industrial Relations Board. The, industrial, the Bahamas Industrial Tribunal, which will now be called the tribunal, was established by the Industrial Relations Amendment Act of 1996, which will be termed the Industrial Relations Act and effectively replaced the former Industrial Relations Board. This resulted from the decision in the case of the Princess Casino versus the Minister of Labor in 1992, which ruled that the arbitration process was voluntary and that all parties had to give consent to the process. This was not agreed to by employers. Hence the government in consultation with the unions established the tribunal. The Industrial Relations Act was amended in 1997 and the jurisdiction of the Industrial Tribunal was stated to include hearing matters involving trade disputes for essential and non-essential services and the recognition and registration of industrial agreements and hear and determine any other matter brought before the tribunal in accordance with the Industrial Relations Act. The tribunal also has powers to order reinstatement, damages and other remedies in the resolution of workplace conflicts and trade disputes Tribunal matters are heard in Nassau and Freeport. The tribunal is accessible to the public as the service of the tribunal is free. Industry, in the individual, sorry, commencing labor related actions, trade disputes do not have to be re represented by legal counsel and may represent themselves at tribunal. The jurisdiction of the industrial tribunal was amended in 2012 to establish the Registrar of Trade Unions and Industrial Agreements would be responsible for the registration of industrial agreements. The Industrial Relations Tribunal Procedure Rules 2010 was enacted in 
in the 7th of December, 2010, to establish the rules and procedures of the tribunal and as a secondary legislation, supplement the Industrial Relations Act, which was later amended in 2012 and 2017. As a quasi-judicial body, the proceedings of the tribunal are, met, are meant to be less costly, more expeditious, and less formal than a court of law in resolving trade and labor matters. The rules relating to the admissibility of evidence that apply to a court of law do not apply to the tribunal and matters are designed to be settled in an informal, cost-effective and less litigious, litigious, litigious sorry, manner. An appeal from a decision of the tribunal may be made in the Supreme Court and further appeal to the Court of Appeal of the Bahamas. However, the tribunal may make inquiries of persons appearing before it as witnesses. Okay, so we have the Bahamas Industrial Tribunal. And this, was, this first of all, let's start off with the Industrial Relations Board in 1970, which was established. And this was enacted pursuant to our legislation, Industrial Relations Act of 1970, um, established to hear disputes essential to service um, for essential services referred by the Minister of Labor, register all industrial agreements and hear any matters relative to the registration of such agreements. Now these industrial agreements, where you know that name from, what usually you associate industrial agreements with? Unions. Yes, yeah, so that's where we get, because you know we are a unionized um, society based on the services we offer and it's just, um, the way we came up, eh? we started off with which union, if you all remember. The union what, um, where they had all the issues. Um, with public service? No, who who started everything out? The hotel union? Hotel. Yeah. Or the, what about the taxi cab fellas? Them as well. Yeah, you know, they were more or less the, in the forefront and then we began with all of the other unions, eh? Correct, yes. Now, the act was amended in 1970 to establish the arbitration tribunal. I don't know if you recall that, if you were old enough to. Um, and it usually dealt with disputes of non-essential services. Essential services was at the Industrial Relations Board. Now they've incorporated both of them based on a decision from the Princess Casino versus the Minister of Labor. And they ruled that the arbitration process was voluntary. And as a result, parties had to give consent to the process. So if a matter was referred to arbitration by whom? Who we say they would have referred it to? All disputes were going to be referred to by whom? The Minister of Labor. Okay, so when he referred this matter for arbitration, I was not bound by decision unless I consented to come into arbitration, eh? because it had to be voluntary. All parties had to give consent. If they didn't give consent, then did they have jurisdiction over me if I am not consented to come to this process? No. Okay, so now it was agreed that they would now establish a tribunal. This tribunal would be more or less, you would be more or less what, what you would be now. Since Forced to do so. Okay, so you now, whatever they say now, you have to follow more or less, eh? Right. So as much as it's not a court, you still, it's a quasi-judicial process, so you still have, they have some teeth, more or less. Now, it was amended in 1997, and as a result, the Industrial Tribunal was in to include to hear all matters involving trade dispute for essential and non-essential services, and recognize and register industrial agreements with that, with the trade union. They will hear and determine any matter, any other matter that was brought before the tribunal in accordance with the Industrial Relations Act. So now the tribunal has powers. They can could, they could order reinstatement where you were dismissed, damages where you um, should have gotten additional funds or, they, that, or you would have lost earnings or you could have um, uh, 
earned in um, future um, income. They will have, yes. Um, good morning. This is Siobhan Linden from Bahamas Mortgage Corporation. Okay, go ahead. So is it my understanding that before the tribe, the industrial tribunal, you had no recourse when you were unfairly dismissed, et cetera? No, no, no. Now, before you would have had to go where? Where we say now? You would have gone where? When to, you were to the courts. Right. right. So okay. now they created this process so that where I am not, I am, I already got dismissed from my job, eh? Right. I don't have the funds to hire a lawyer just to get in the Supreme Court. The formal rules of evidence would apply, so I would have to reach a burden, a higher burden. What's what? What? Now this is a civil matter. What my my burden would have been? I have to, evidence. Have to hire a lawyer. And what I would be on the balance of what? Beyond reasonable doubt. Okay. Uh, what is it? No. What what we say on the balance of what for civil matters? Probabilities. Okay. And. So the more and it's more formal, right? So they wouldn't consider anything outside of what is on the balance of probabilities that this happened and she should have been dismissed. Or was she unfairly dismissed based on the now in this process, we allow we don't we're not so rigid with our evidential rules. And additionally, you as your you as the person can represent yourself, you don't need a lawyer. Okay. The process is more user friendly. I can come into the court and I would get assistance from a registrar or the secretary to the tribunal in assisting me in getting the forms filled out, presented. They would give me more guidance. Eh? Now, it's earlier, a, I heard, go ahead. Earlier, earlier, I also heard you were saying that they were called presidents and now they're called ju justices or ju um, right. So now they, they yeah, it, 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 they're now given the name of judges, but they are still referred to as Madam President or Madam Vice President or Mr. President or, Ms. or Mr. Vice President. And these would also be legal authorities, like a judge or? Yes, they have legal authority. However, it still isn't as high a court as it, the, the evidentiary burden is not as high. The process is not as formal as you would have in a Supreme Court because a lot of allowances you're granted in this court would not be allowed if you were in a Supreme Court setting. Understood. Thank you. So that's that's the difference with this. And it's more friendly to um, the person who wouldn't have the means to um, hire, hire a, a big personal. lawyer. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> So it's a little more friendly and it is some, you can um, present yourself and you won't be where they'll say, well, no, no, you can't say that in here or you can't do certain things. You would be able to express yourself a little more freely than you would have if you were at um, the Supreme Court because you have to follow certain protocols and policies and procedures in the Supreme Court, whereas this is a less formal process. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So now we have the, the proceedings are meant to be. Okay, first, I think we were still at registering the, the documents. Hey, take me back where we were because I already gone. We were then where it was amended and we recognized and registered industrial agreements. So the, they have powers of reinstatement, damages, and other remedies for resolution of workplace conflicts and trade disputes. We have a lot of trade disputes. So say, for instance, I am a nurse and I'm a part of the union. What happens with the nurses? You mean what happened recently? Just say, for instance, I'm a nurse. We are part of nurse. What they, what they had recently, they say, we were working hours, certain hours. Work to rule. Right, because what happened? What did they say first? We were working these long hours and we weren't getting our overtime or we were working in hardship, all of those stuff. So now they would come to the board as a, as a union and say, you know, um, we need to be compensated according to our industrial agreement. We're supposed to get this, that, and the next thing. And what happens? You are not honoring your part of the bargain. So what happens when they do this? 
if if you don't if you don't come to the table with them, what they say? They're gonna file a trade dispute. Ah, uh, right. So we're gonna we have to file a trade dispute. There's some issues here we need to resolve. So when we file a trade dispute, it could be referred to where? The, the tribunal. Right to the we will send it first. We go to the minister of labor, labor department. And and he will now, if he can't resolve it, we'll find that out later and we'll open that up when we go into our readings. But then he'll refer to the industrial tribunal if it can't be resolved. There are these people may say, I don't want to go to the industrial tribunal. I won't go straight to the Supreme Court because I want to be able to enforce my actions and get a little bit more in damages. See? So in that instance, so we they deal with trade dispute. Now, where we have this. These persons can now, what happens with this service at the tribunal? Would they say what is particular about this? This is free, is accessible to the public and the service is free. That means in some actions, I may have to find a hundred dollars to file papers. I may need to know what papers to file. If I don't know what to file, I gotta find it out myself. Whereas I may be, it's accessible. I can go to the tribunal, ask them, I wanna file a, I want to file an action against my employer. They may guide me through the process, give me form A, form B, and then I just fill those out, bring it back. In a certain time, they give me. So it's a more friendly process and it's free. That's important for um, individuals who are unable to pay for legal counsel. They do not have to be represented by a lawyer and they can represent themselves at the tribunal. This, this um, doesn't disqualify um, this process completely because this can also happen at the Supreme Court. But based on the formalities in the Supreme Court, you may get lost in there trying to represent yourself. And really and truly, there's no one there to aid you through the process because you're taking it upon yourself to come into a Supreme Court setting. You should know what you're coming for. So you're not going to have someone to guide you through the process as you would in the tribunal process. Again, it's the tribunal process is less costly. It's more expeditious means it's gonna go fast. So you don't have to wait on all these long Toronto dates um, for you to hear from the court or you won't have, they won't put you on the calendar until 2025. You may get a quick date, it's less formal and they try to resolve the matters between the parties more amicably. Um, admissibility of evidence that apply to the court will not apply here. And the matters are designed to be settled in an informal cost effective and less litigious manner. So when you get there, they're not gonna encourage you just to be adversarial. So it's more or less, why they'll send you away a, couple, uh, a few times to say, perhaps you all two can talk this over. We're gonna give you a chance in accordance with that to stand down and you to discuss this matter to see if you all can reach a resolution before the court steps in. So the court more or less is still acting as a mediator of sorts, but they're there to enforce whatever they feel should be the case. So you still would present your case uh, if, it if it comes to that, but more or less they're looking for it to be less litigious. So it won't be so that you need a, an attorney present and you you'll go through the process where they're trying to see if you can reach a medium and everybody can leave out feeling like it's a win-win situation. If you want to appeal these decisions, however, it has to be made at the Supreme Court and it can be further appealed at the Court of Appeal. Um, you would find that enforcement of the orders, may you may have to um, enforce your orders at the Supreme Court where there's money involved and the persons won't um, um, are not adhering to it, you may enforce your orders at the Supreme Court again, or you may appeal a decision at the Supreme Court and a further appeal at the Court of Appeal. However, the tribunal um, may make inquiries of persons who appear. So in the instance, you may bring a witness and so then you would be um, more or less examined by the um, tribunal or the president, um, vice president at the court. Um, of matters that are concerning um, the court at that time. So where you may give evidence or you may have said something has happened, they would call you in as a witness 
just to verify the facts. Any questions on the industrial tribunal so far? We understand the process so far? Yes. Okay, let's move on. Uh, okay, who can help us out? I think um, Ms. George was helping us. Thank you. Who can help us now? I don't mind. I'll go. I don't mind. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The tribunal is comprised of three members appointed by the Governor General acting on behalf, sorry, acting on the advice of the, Judici the Judicial and Legal Service Commission. The three members include the president and two vice presidents, one in Nassau and one in Freeport. These members have security of tenure under the Industrial Relations Act until retirement at the age of 65, although the retirement age can be extended to 67 by the governor general on the advice of and consultation with the Judicial and Legal Services Commission, resignation and or removal. In other words, there is no specified number of years that they are contracted to serve on the tribunal. Any member of the tribunal may sit alone, hear and adjudicate a matter which is often the case. Matters may be heard in Nassau, Freeport or any other place that the president may elect to hear proceedings. The overall administration and legal oversight of the tribunal are the responsibility of the president of the tribunal who acts as the chief arbiter or tr of trade disputes although the president and vice presidents have equal power, authority, and jurisdiction to hear and adjudicate trade disputes under the Industrial Relations Act. The president and vice presidents may be counsel and attorney at law of the Bar of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas or any member of the Bar of England and Wales, the Bar of Scotland or the Bar of Ireland with no less than 10 years post-call legal experience. The president and vice presidents of the tribunal may also be assisted in the resolution of trade disputes by a panel comprised of fit and proper persons from a trade and industry, financial services, labor unions, and other areas of Bahamian society who are selected by the director of labor upon consultation with various employers and employee associations. The number of persons on the appointed panel is limited to 12, six of which are appointed by the Director of Labor after consultation with Employees Association and the other six after consultation with Employee Associations. The term of office on the panel is limited to three years and the Director of Labor has the power to revoke the appointment of any member that he deems does not deem fit to continue serving. The president has the power to select one person from the panel appointed after consultation with the associations of employers and one person appointed after consultation with the employees trade unions to sit on the full tribunal. After hearing the matter before it, any de determination by the full tribunal is made by the majority of its members. The Minister of Labor has the power and is required under the provisions of the Industrial Relations Act to refer a trade dispute to the tribunal, which he has had difficulty settling or resolving, particularly within the time limits established by the Industrial Relations Act, Island Construction Company Limited versus Industrial Tribunal, the AG and, and Commonwealth Wholesale Retail and Allied Workers Union, Appeal Number 29 of 2003, Bahamas Court of Appeal. Jurisdiction. Hello? Okay. okay, hold on. Okay. So we have the composition of the tribunal now. So let's make a note of our composition. The composition is um, comp it's comprised of three members and they are appointed by the governor general acting on the advice of the Judicial and Legal Service Commission. So these three persons are usually appointed on the advice of the Judicial and Legal Service Commission and they are appointed by the governor general. So we have a president and two vice presidents. And the two vice presidents, one is in Nassau and one is in Freeport. And they have security of tenure until they attain the age of um, 65. And it, um, 
retirement age can be extended to 67 again by the Governor General on the advice of the Judicial and Legal Service Commission, or if they are resigned or removed from their post. So they don't have any specified number of years to be um, contracted with the, so you don't have where, okay, your contract of service is only for a year. They have security of tenure. So we have, who else have security of tenure we know of in the government of the Bahamas? Commissioner of Police. Yes, yes, yes. Commissioner of Police, the judges. So they have security of tenure. Now, the tribunal, they may sit alone or they can adjudicate matters um, with more than one person, so they can do it al along with a committee, eh? So, the overall administration and oversight of the tribunal is the responsibility of the president who acts as the chief arbiter of the trade disputes. Um, although the president and vice presidents have equal power, authority, and um, jurisdiction to hear and adjudicate the trade dispute. So notwithstanding all of them are equal footing, the president is the chief arbiter and they have, and she has the overall responsibility for um, the tribunal. Now, just a stick up in here. Um, let's just put on the side that, that we're gonna use that as our homework to confirm who's the president mm -hmm. Vice President of the Tribunal, okay? Put a little pin and stick it there. That's what you all find out for me for next week, okay? These um, persons um, may be um, attorneys at law called to the Bar of the Commonwealth, England and Wales, the Bar of Scotland or the Bar of Ireland. They should have no less than 10 years experience post-call legal experience. Now, again, they're assisted by a panel. So sometimes you have the judges may sit with a panel who would, you have that in the children's court where they have a panel of persons who are fit and proper, or who more or less make up a cross section of society. In this instance, we may have persons who are um, like the director of labor, you may have persons from the financial services area or other areas of Bahamian society, you may have someone from the hotel um, area to assist um, in making decisions. And it's usually a panel of 12 persons, six are appointed by the director of labor after consultation with the employees association and the other six with um, consultation with the employees association. Their panel is only Miss Darcy, you mute it. Oh, sorry. Why this doing this? Um, sorry again. The president has the power to select one person from the panel appointed after consultation with the association of employers and one person appointed after consultation with the employees trade union to sit on full tribunal. Um, the tribunal, um, the full tribunal, um, the decision is usually rendered by the majority of its members. Now we also, I don't know if you've ever been in an industrial tribunal where you would have a panel sitting. Um, they tend to assist in larger matters and in particular where we have those um, trade disputes with the unions. Um, you may have a panel who would assist in making decisions because they would be well versed on um, the agreements and how they play out the procedures and policies for following. And so they would assist in making decisions as to what should move forward and how it should um, proceed. Um, the Minister of Labor has the power to refer a dispute to a trade dispute to the tribunal where he has a difficulty in settling or resolving an issue. 
So you would find, um, you may not sit actually with the Minister of Labor at the Labor Board. You may sit with one of their conciliators. However, they act in his stead. And so where the issue cannot be resolved, um, you would write back to, um, you, they would ask you to confirm that you've tried conciliation. The process has not worked. So you will write now and ask for the matter to be referred um, because there's no resolution to the matter. And so there, thereafter, the Minister of Labor will now um, transfer the matter or refer it um, to the tribunal for um, it to be resolved there at the tribunal because it's not been um, resolved down at the Ministry of Labor, at the Department of Labor. So we have a case um, where the principal was derived, Island Construction Company versus the Industrial Tribunal, um, the AG and Commonwealth Wholesale and Wholesale Retail and Allied Workers Union. So in this instance where there is no um, resolution, the minister can now um, transfer the matter or refer the matter to the Industrial Tribunal for it to be resolved. So we have the composition, we have the three, um, members, we have how their, their tenure is, what their qualifications are, who's the chief arbiter. We have also the panel, which makes up um, the tribunal, and it consists of 12 persons, six are on the, uh, as directed by the, minister, the director of labor, and six after consultation with employees association. The term of office is only three years, whereas the composition of the tribunal, what is their term of office? Or if they want to resign or they remove, they so they have tenure of um tenure of service more or less. How are the um president, vice presidents, how are they appointed? Governor General. Right. Mm -hmm. Governor General, what else? on the advice of the Judicial and Legal Service Commission. Excellent. Okay, we have any um, questions on the composition? We know the composition now? Yes. I have a, a quick question. Can, go can a complainant go directly to the tribunal um, instead of going through the Department of Labor to hear a dispute? You can, you can forego that process, but it's usually better for you to follow the process um, just because sometimes people just skip this whole process. They don't even, they go straight to the Supreme Court. So it's up to you where you choose, because you may say, I'm gonna go to the Department of Labor. Then some people say, I don't, I'm not even dealing with the Labor Department. I'm going straight to the tribunal. Okay. So it's, it's your choice where you go um, initially. So Sometimes you feel you may get some resolution down at the Department of Labor, whereas some people say, I'm not even gonna waste my time because this is not gonna settle there because they, they have their position and I have my own. So I'm just gonna go directly to the industrial tribunal or I may just go to the Supreme Court if I have the means to do so, or if I feel that the case um, warrants it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, you can perhaps continue for us, um, Ms. Linden, and then we'll move on to the next person. All right. Thank you. J jurisdiction. The tribunal generally pairs and determine trade disputes referred to it by the labor board or directly by an aggrieved applicant, example, employee, employer, etc. cetera. Registrar industrial agreements and adjudicates matters relating to the registration of industrial agreements, although it may hear and adjudicate other matters under the purview of the Industrial Relations Act. Many of the matters which the tribunal hears relate to wrongful dismissal or industrial agreement contract negotiations. The tribunal may hear, receive, and consider written or oral submissions, arguments, and evidence made by or on behalf of an employer or employee trade union representing the employee in the trade dispute or any person who is a, who, who has experience in trade unionism, unionism as prescribed by section 57.3 of the Industrial Relations Act. 
for the purpose of Section 2 of the Industrial Relations Amendment Act 2012. A trade dispute or dispute is any dispute or difference or apprehended dispute or difference between one or more employers and one or more employees or between one or more employees and one or more other employees, which is connected with the employment or non-employment or the terms or conditions of employment any of any person and includes a general dispute and a limited dispute and any dispute or difference or apprehended dispute or difference concerning the interpretation, application, administration, or alleged violation of an industrial agreement affecting an employee and the failure and refusal of an employee to treat and enter into negotiations with the trade union, which is the bargaining agent for employees in a bargaining unit. A general dispute means a trade dispute between an employer and, an, and his employees or any of them over the creation of new terms or conditions of employment of any such employees. A limited dispute means a trade dispute between an employer and one or more of his employees over the application of such employee or employees of existing terms or conditions of employment or the, or the denial of any right applicable to such employee or employees in relation to his or her term employment. An aggrieved applicant or complainant to the industrial tribunal may appear in person or may be represented by a counsel and attorney at law, shop steward, or by any officer of the registered trade union. Okay, so we have the jurisdiction now. So we dealt with the industrial tribunal their composition, and now we're dealing with the jurisdiction of the tribunal. So the tribunal is there to hear and determine trade disputes referred to it by the labor board, or where the question was, if I can go there directly or directly, you see that? By an aggrieved app applicant. So you can, it can be referred to, or you can go directly. Yes? Yes. Thank you. Um, so now we can register, they register industrial agreements. They adjudicate on matters relating to the registration of industrial agreements. And it may hear and adjudicate other matters under the purview of the Industrial Relations Act. So anything that falls within or under the Industrial Relations Act, they may hear and adjudicate on those matters. Most of the matters that come before the tribunal delay um, relate to wrongful dismissal or industrial contract negotiations. So based on them being the, per, the, the uh, tribunal that relate, that deals with the registration of industrial agreements, we would note that uh, most of the agreements that are formed industrial wise with the unions with um, as a whole, go through this tribe, um, this industrial tribunal to um, be resolved, eh? or to be registered. So it'll be, they would, they would sit and hear um, what agreements are going to be put in place on behalf of whomever is being, is registering the um, industrial agreements. Now the tribunal may hear, receive and consider written oral submission, arguments and evidence made on, by or on behalf of an employer or employee, the trade union representing the employee in the trade dispute or by any person who has experience in trade unionism as prescribed by section 57 three of the industrial relations act. So we have what a trade dispute is and that is um, defined under section two of the industrial relations amendment act 2012. And that's any dispute or difference or apprehended dispute or difference between one or more employers and one or more employees. Then we have any dispute or difference or apprehended dispute or difference concerning the interpretation, application, administration, or alleged violation of an industrial agreement affecting any employee and where the employer refuses to treat an intent to negotiations with the trade union. Then there's a general dispute, which is a trade dispute between an employer and his employees or any of them over the creation of new terms or conditions of employment. 
So in an instance where I am working in a bank and you had me hired working Monday to Friday, nine to three, and you now unilaterally change my um, conditions of employment to work um, Monday to Saturday, nine to two um, through the week and nine to one on Saturday. What's the difference? What, what I can do now? What I have? Would that be a trade dispute? Mm -hmm. Basically, that's, just based on changing. Um, what, what, yes, that is. Employment. what that would be. So that's a general. A dispute, dispute. Of employment. So yeah, that's general general, eh? That's a general. That's an example of what could be a general. So you can't unilaterally change my conditions of employment. We have to agree. Eh? Correct. Just now, point. where there's a limited dispute, where we have one or more employees may have a dispute over the application of existing terms of the conditions employ of employment or the denial of any right applicable to such employee. There's this only for a, a limited area of my employment contract. So we now would have a trade dispute again where we would, this can be what? Referred to whom? The director of labor. So this is a trade dispute and it will be referred to the director of labor. He can now refer to the industrial tribunal or I can mm -hmm. go directly to them, eh? Yeah, yeah. So how can I appear before the tribunal? Make an application. Right, or and how I appear. Or be, re be referred. Right, but how is my appearance made? Through a counsel of attorney? In Show, to my shop store. Okay, I could go in person. I can be represented by a counsel, an attorney at law, a shop steward, or by any officer of a registered um, trade union. So if I'm not familiar with the process, I don't feel comfortable, I can find somebody who is either a shop steward or officer of a registered trade union, counsel or attorney, um, to represent me at the tribunal. Okay, so that's our jurisdiction. Of, so we have the quasi-judicial process where we established um, employment tribunals, and then we have composition the um, the the Bahamas Industrial Tribunal, which derives from the quasi-judicial process. Then we go on to the composition of the Industrial Tribunal, which deals with how persons are appointed, and then we have the jurisdiction where their arm, their arm, how far their arm reaches, how you are able to approach them, how you appear there and um, what, for what purposes you can attend. And the purposes are outlined on the section two of the Industrial Relations Amendment Act 2012, where it's a trade dispute. Any questions on that? No, I'm sorry, Ms. Dorset, I have a question. Forgive me if I forgive me and Miss Dorset and, and my fellow classmates if I see if it appears um, controversial, right? But the general dispute which means a trade dispute between an employee and his employees or any of them over the creation of new terms or condition of employment. Um, referring to where we are right now and dealing with today and the whole vaccination thing, and with them saying you have to be vaccinated if you want to work and all that, would that be then considered a general dispute? Can it be filed as? Or can it be considered as a general dispute? Yeah, but you have a lot of people who are now taking that matter to court, eh? Yes, yeah. yeah. That's, that's so, what I said. Yeah, because you're now changing the terms of my employment. Now, yeah. you would say that these things come into being. So when they came into being, that still you have to now, we have to renegotiate, eh? Mm -hmm. Because if you require me to get certain things, I may require you to pay me some additional funds to get these things, eh? So and, we, and, uh, I think, yeah, sorry, go on. Um, but it's also, you know, it's open to how I'm going to go negotiate because I, as the employer, may say, well, I'm not able to facilitate you. So we may have to part ways or you may say me as the employee, I'm not prepared to do that. So I may have to part ways. So it's equal access. Eh? Um, so it's it has to be fair on both sides. Yeah. So is there a way then, I guess, that, uh, I guess, um, 
in contractual, the employer has the right now to, to I guess, form a new contract post the whole situation now and saying anyone that would be in my employee as of a certain date now then has to be, but all those that would have been before isn't yeah, an issue. I have, to, I have to agree because remember the contract is offer and acceptance. And so it can be one-sided. It, it's not yeah, unilateral. Yeah, I mean, okay, I mean, based on offer and acceptance. Yeah, so for, I mean, okay, just saying. So you offering me new terms of employment. You telling me if I want to continue working here? I have to but do not, certain things. But not for a, a, a previously employed person. It's like, if you were employed on Monday, then uh -huh. you get what happens. But when my new contract comes out for someone who's coming on Friday, my new uh -huh. contract would then say, you need to be. Is that legal? Well, I mean, if it doesn't contravene any laws, then it is. If you're not trampling on any rights, it is. Okay. So it's not one, it's not so direct because there are all, there's more than one law that may affect that. So you may now look at the health and safety regulations. So what we have to look at when we're talking about employment, what are we looking at? The employment act. We well, have Employment Act, we have the Employment Amendment Act, we have the Minimum Wages Act, we have Health and Safety at Work. Yeah. So we have to look at all these things to make sure that you're not discriminating against me or um, you're not taking my health into consideration as a part of my employment because all of these things are rights that are enforced, eh? Yeah. And then yeah. I can also, what is the highest um, law of the land? The primary source of legislation. The Constitution. Right. So make sure you don't, you are not contra contravening the con my constitutional rights as well, eh? Because okay. any act that's in the Bahamas comes secondary to the Constitution, eh? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? I have a question on the example that you gave regarding the bank's changing of hours, adding an extra day of work. Mm -hmm. In the example that you gave, they didn't increase the number of hours. They just reallocated the way those hours were spread out. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah. So they may change just to say, well, you know, I'm not, I've not changed your working hours. I just changed the days you work. Okay. But in this particular case, it would, there would be some dispute with the fact that an employee is entitled to 24 straight hours um, of rest and then an additional 24 hours, which don't have to be consecutive. Right now, it's only 24 hours. What do you say a day off is? 20, 24 hours. hours. Yeah, I only need to give you 24 hours, eh? Um, well, but then it's, your work week, what your work week is, what the hours for the work week is, is according to, what, is according to how you work, eh? But you should have at least 24 hours as a day off in any given work week, eh? Right, you 24, have consecutive 24 hours. hours. Right. right. So, so what about the second day off, which in this case, if you're working them Monday to Saturday, there isn't a second day off, even though their hours are less per day. But so they gave you full 24 Monday. hours off, eh? You don't have Sunday. They give you full 24 hours. Right, on the Sunday would be the full 24 hours. So the right. employer would not be obligated to... to give the employee the other, oh, I see, because they shorten the days, they actually get the additional right, they, hours. Oh, right, because right. okay. they're making sure they within this 40 hour work week. Yes. But that doesn't change the fact that I was contracted to work Monday to Friday. Okay. How would an employee win an argument like that then? Yeah, but I mean, you either, you can say you, you hired me to work Monday to Friday. So if you change in your hours, then if you change in the days that I work, you've changed my contract. I have to now accept that, eh? Okay. And if, if I don't if accept we, that, what I what I what I must do? You can you can move on. I have another question. What if your regular schedule what were not regular days? You typically could be scheduled different hours, different days if there was so scheduled then, work. So Would now you have you an argument with that? No, no, because you hired me. When I was hired, I was hired as a shift worker. Uh, so that means I don't have any set day to be on or off. Got you. Okay. You see? I so I, I could change the days like that. Go ahead. Uh, just a question piggybacking off 
Catherine's question um, with the same bank example. You're normally in the interviews, we ask the applicant, are you prepared to work or are you available to work on weekends should the need arise? And in most interviews, everybody says yes. So, so I'm, I'm available to work should it arise, but it can be that that's scheduled date. Eh? Okay, okay. But, but, but you didn't, you're not saying that that's going to happen as a regular Every week. week. Right. But now when you make it regular, what you making that a part of my working hours now. Okay. So then I'm thinking if the need arise, that's a little bit of overtime. That's not you telling me you're going to start using my Saturdays every other Saturday. Okay. So what I'm trying to get at is then if that is the case that I may need you for Saturday employment mm -hmm. in the interviews, I have to actually set that out. So I should say that my bank is open on Saturdays and you would be required to work on Saturdays and you should have a timeline as to when I'm going to be working on Saturdays. Okay. Because okay. then I should know what I'm, how I'm working. And once that is discussed in the interview process, mm -hmm. then that mitigates from the dispute. Now, it can't just be discussed. It has to be a part of my contract. Contract. Okay. Very well. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Okay, so let's do powers of the tribunal. Who's gonna help us with that? Thank you. Um, I think it was Ms. Linden who just helped us, right? Yes, you're welcome. Okay, thank you. Let's move on. Who can read for us next, please? I'll read. Okay, thanks. Powers of the tribunal. The industrial tribunal has the following powers. One, remit a dispute to the, to the parties for further consideration or discussion by them in an effort to reduce, to reduce and or resolve the issues related to the particular matter. In other words, it may remit the matter back to conciliation meetings with the labor board or independently as parties to the matter. Two, make a provisional interim or final order or award in relation to the trade dispute. Three, give directions regarding the hearing or determination of a trade dispute. Four, award compensation to an aggrieved, award compensation to an aggrieved to proceedings before the industrial tribunal upon filing a complaint or application for any breach or non-compliance with an order or award with the exception of an order or award for the payment of damages or compensation. Five, dismiss a matter or part of a trade dispute or other matter brought before it or refrain from further hearing or determining the matter for triviality, frivolity, or if further proceedings are deemed unnecessary or undesirable in the public interest under Section 58 of the Industrial Relations Act. Six, order any person who in the opinion of the tribunal may be affected by an order or award or who the tribunal considers is just to be joined as a party to the proceedings on terms and conditions specified by the tribunal. Seven, hear and adjudicate any question which may arise in relation to a trade dispute in the absence of any party who has been summoned to appear before the tribunal and has failed to do so. Eight, give directions and do all such things that are necessary or expedient to justify, to justly and fairly adjudicate matters before it in a timely manner. Nine, award interest at a rate that it thinks fit on the whole or part of any order or award of a sum as compensation and damages. And 10, conduct its proceedings in a matter that it deems appropriate and just in accordance with the provisions of the Industrial Relations Act. The tribunal may issue orders and awards based upon its adjudication of trade and other disputes, but it cannot enforce its own orders and awards. The enforcement of any order or award by the tri tribunal must be made on application to the Supreme Court who may enforce an order or award in the same manner 
and to the same extent or effect as a judgment or other of the Supreme Court. Okay, so we have the powers of the tribunal and they can remit a dispute to the parties for further consideration or discussion. So what we say, what usually happens when you get there, they, they um, tell you to go away and try to resolve it again. They said they can send it back to the labor board or they can tell the parties, you know, y'all should go ahead, discuss. I think y'all can reach a second. They may be able to make a provisional interim or final order award in relation to a trade dispute. So they can say, um, you can, for this time, you can deal with this. We'll make this interim um, order or award, or we can make a final order or award. So the final order may be you reinstate this person or you pay them um, for unfair dismissal um, where there's, um, where, the, where they realize the parties will not be able to continue um, working as employer employee. They may give direction regarding the hearing or determination of a trade dispute. So they may say what's gonna happen, how it's gonna be heard and how it will be determined. The trade dispute, they can award compensation to agree with parties um, where there's a breach or non-compliance with an order or award. So they can award the compensation. So let's pay particular attention to that. So where there's non-compliance or breach, they can award compensation. They cannot, they don't have um, the powers or the, the exception is they cannot award for payment of damages or compensation. They can dismiss a matter in part or part of a trade dispute or other matter board before it or refrain from further hearing or determining the matter for triviality, frivolity, or if the further proceedings are deemed unnecessary or undesirable in the interest of the public. So you may just be there doing foolishness, trivial matters, you just dragging stuff on, we'll just dismiss the matter. It doesn't make sense for us to continue. They may order any person who, in the opinion of the tribunal, may be affected by an order or award to be joined to a party as a party to the proceedings. So I can join you where I feel you should be a party to these proceedings or the person should be able to um, recover from you. Uh, you should be, so it may be um, ABC Company Limited and they're um, the managing director or the managing or the majority shareholder. I may consider that they were acting outside of their role as a majority shareholder. Um, I would say they should be joined to these proceedings just in case the company don't have any more money. These people would have detrimentally relied on the promises given by this person in their capacity, not as a shareholder. They gave this, um, this guarantee outside of their role in the company. And so I think they should be joined to the proceedings and they should be held accountable to pay these this person just in case they say the company is barely up. These persons relied on their assurances, so let's join them as a party to the proceedings. Or I may say you brought the wrong person before the court. This person should also be a party to these proceedings. If they summon you before the court in your absence, they can still hear the matter. If you choose not to come, they can hear the matter um, and adjudicate any question that arises in relation to the trade dispute. They can give directions on all such things that are necessary to justly and fairly adjudicate matters in a timely manner. Um, they may award interest at a rate that they think fit on the whole or part of the whole of any order or award um, of a sum as compensation and damages. So they can give you interest on the on at the rate on your um, award or the order itself. They can conduct the proceedings in any manner they deem appropriate and just in accordance with um, the provisions of the Industrial Relation Act. So when they give award, they give awards or orders, they cannot enforce their own or awards or orders. So if I um, say I award you to be paid $10,000 um, as an award for unfair dismissal, 
and your employer has not paid it, the industrial tribunal will not be able to enforce that um, order. You would have to go to the Supreme Court now to enforce the order um, to the same extent as it would have been as a judgment of the Supreme Court. So where your employer fails to um, pay you, in order for you to enforce the award, you go to the Supreme Court for, to have it enforced. You don't come back to the industrial tribunal because they are not um, able to enforce orders, okay? Any questions? Okay. You can hear me, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. You you all following me so far? Yeah. We are. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Okay. Go ahead, um, Kendra, please. Yes. I'm gonna read. Um, Miss Miss Dorset. I'm gonna read up to number three, and then I guess someone can take over from there because it's a lot. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Industrial Tribunal Procedural Rules. Under the provisions of the Industrial Relations Tribunal Procedure Rules 1997, the Industrial Tribunal Rules, the procedure to commence a trade dispute in the tribunal is as follows. One, part, after a party has filed a trade dispute with the Minister of Labor through the Labor Board, outlining the grounds and particulars of the dispute, the matter is referred by the Minister of Labor to the tribunal after conciliation with the parties. Two, the party must prepare and file an originating application as prescribed in form A of the schedule of the industrial tribunal rules with the secretary of the tribunal within 14 days of receiving notice of the referral of the matter by the minister of labor to the tribunal. Under section three, article two of the industrial tribunal rules, the originating application must include the following information and be signed by the applicant. A, name and address of the party. B, name and address of the respondent. C, the relief sought. And D, the grounds with particulars thereof on which the relief is sought. If in his opinion, any of the aforementioned information is not sufficiently particularized in the originating application, the president may request further particulars from the applicant, which he must submit to the secretary within 14 days of the tribunal's notice to furnish such particulars in supporting the originating application as prescribed in form B of the schedule of the industrial rules. If the party fails to comply with the requirement to submit further particulars, the tribunal has the power to strike out the hold the whole and any part, the, hold on, sorry. If the party fails to comply with the requirement to submit further particulars, the tribunal has the power to strike out the whole or any part, the originating application. I guess I should say any part of. If the party is represented by counsel, a brief or skeleton argument may be submitted to the secretary and a copy served on the other party no later than seven days prior to the commencement of the hearing. An unrepresented party may also submit representations in writing for the consideration by the tribunal at the hearing or the originating application. The representation must be submitted to the secretary no later than seven days before the commencement of the hearing and shall at the same time serve a copy thereof on the other parties to the proceedings. Three, after the, after the applicant has filed the originating application with the secretary, the secretary sends the following information to the respondent, a copy of the application, a copy of any additional particulars required to be furnished by the applicant, and a notice in form C in the schedule, which includes information as appropriate to the case about the means and time for entering an appearance and defense, the consequences of failure to do so, and the right to receive a copy of the decision. Okay, so we have now, we get it started. So we don't have to go through the whole thing. We could do it in pieces just like we did. 
So the Industrial Tribunal procedural rules. So the procedure to commence a trade dispute. Now it seems like it's a lot going on, but it's really um, a distinct process and it's not as labor intensive as, as it looks. So once you would have filed your dispute with the Minister of Labor through the Labor Board outlining the grounds and particulars of your dispute. So I filed a dispute. Um, I was working with this company A for seven years. I've been made redundant. Um, they have refused to pay me my redundancy payment. They've, I've been a manager supervisor. They now want to pay me as a regular um, staff member and they want to pay me at the rate where I was employed. I was making $200 when I started working since that time for the seven years, I'm now at $400. So they're supposed to pay me my month's salary, um, $400 up to and including the seven years. So I should get four times um, seven. I should get my two weeks. Um, I should get a month for this, uh, all of that stuff. They're now trying to pay me as a regular employee and they want to pay me at the rate where I was initially employed. I have a dispute. I went to the labor board. They're saying, no, I was, she was never a supervisor. We gave her $400, but the, um, that was based on commission. That's not a salary. She could have made 220, she could have made 250. She just was making $400 because business was good. I have nothing in writing to show they ever raised my salary. Um, I don't have any paperwork, so that's where the dispute comes in. I'm filing a dispute with the labor board to say I should be getting $400. I should get um, compensated. My money should be paid out to me. Um, the dispute continues because they're denying what I'm saying, and I'm, I am adamant that this happened. So now the, the, the uh, ministry, the Minister of Labor says we can't resolve this. I have to refer it on to. Um, the tribunal for the parties to resolve this trade dispute. So once he refers the matter on, I am now to prepare an originating application, which is form A with the secretary of the tribunal. And this has to be done within 14 days of me receiving notice that the matter has been referred to the tribunal. And under section 3.2, of the industrial tribunal rules. I have to sign the application. I have to include the name and address of my name and address. I have to include the name and address of the respondent. In this case, it will be my employer. So that'll be ABC Limited um, located on Bay Street, Nassau, Bahamas. What relief am I seeking? I'm seeking to be compensated in this instance, or I may be, I may have been seeking to be reinstated, um, or I want a ward um, for the long time. I've been, I, I may not be able to even get employment in the future based on what they've done. The grounds are, I was working, they have um, not picked, they, I was working for seven years. I was a supervisor. My salary went from 200 to 400. Um, my grounds are I should have been, made, I was made redundant. I should have been paid at a rate of whatever. And I set out the particulars of my claim. If it's not sufficiently particularized, where I have not set out enough information in the originating application, the president may request further um, particulars which um, means I need to include some more information. I've left out some stuff, so they send it back to me. The secretary, um, what the president has asked you, the secretary can talk to you. You have to now furnish them with more particulars within 14 days um, to after they would have requested it to support your originated application. And this is set out in form B. So they, all of these things are available and you would be more or less help through the process in what you need to do next. However, if you fail to submit the further particulars, the, the tribunal has the power to strike out the whole or part of your um, originating application. So they may do it as well as they may see that you really didn't understand and they may still help you to get it sorted out. They may give you some extended time to get it 
um, sorted out with a little bit more guidance. If you're represented by counsel, they would usually prepare skeleton arguments. And this is um, submitted to the secretary. And then you serve on the party no later than seven days prior to the date when they're going to start the hearing. As an unrepresented party where I'm not represented by counsel, I may make submissions in writing as well for consideration on the hearing of an application. And um, it should be, again, served no later than seven days before the commencement of serve of the hearing, and it should be served on the other parties to the proceedings at the same time. When you send, when you what, when you would have already filed your originated application with the secretary, the secretary would now furnish the respondent with this info, with the following information, which is a copy of the application, which you would have set out, a copy of any additional particulars, which they may have asked you to um, fill in, a notice in the form C, which is um, includes information as appropriate to the case. So that means whatever information relating to the case that's before it and it tells them about the means and the time for entering an appearance and defense and the consequences where they fail to do so and the right for them to receive a copy of the decision once the matter has been resolved. Any questions? So, mm -hmm. so far we only have the originating application that has been done and it served on the parties, including all the particulars, which you're looking for, um, how you want to be compensated, all of that stuff. Any questions? Okay, let's continue. We'll do number four to nine. Who can do four to nine for me, please? I, I will do it. Thank you. The respondent has seven days within the date of receiving a copy of the originating application to enter an appearance to the proceedings by submitting to the secretary a notice of appearance in the prescribed form D of the schedule, which should provide the respondent's full name and address and his or her its decision whether or not it intends to resist and defend the application. The respondents who do not enter an appearance or file a notice of appearance may not participate in the proceedings unless they make an application for an extension to enter an appearance under Rule 14 or make an application under 7-1-A of the Industrial Tribunal's rules or acts as a witness in the proceedings. Five, the secretary sends a copy of the notice of appearance to the applicant upon receipt of the notice from the respondent. Six, a respondent who intends to resist or defend the application is required to file a defense in the prescribed form E in the schedule within 14 days of entering an appearance to the proceeding, which sets out the particulars of the grounds to resist or defend the application. The tribunal has the power under section seven of the industrial tribunal's rules to request that further particulars be submitted by the respondent to the secretary in the prescribed form F of the schedule of the grounds to resist the originating application on application of a party or at the hearing of the originating application or of its own motion. Additionally, the tribunal also has the power under section seven to require one party to grant another discovery or any inspection of documents as a Supreme Court may have the power to do. It may also appoint a time and place for such discovery or inspection of documents to take place. On application eight, on application of a party to the proceedings in the prescribed form G of the schedule or at the hearing of the originating application, the tribunal may require the attendance of any person, including a party, as a witness. And if it requires the person to attend as a witness, may also require him to furnish such document or documents which may relate to the matter before it, inclusive of the time and place for attendance as a witness and the production of the requested document or documents. Nine. The tribunal may require an application by a party to the proceedings in the prescribed form H of the schedule or of its own motion require a person to furnish a written answer to any question if it considers that answer may clarify any issue or issues likely to arise in the determination of the proceedings and that it would likely assist in the progress of the proceedings for that answer to be available to the tribunal before the hearing. The requirement for a written answer is normally imposed on a party in its absence or to a person other than a party to the proceedings. 
that party or person may make application to vary or set aside the requirement under form one of the schedule before the time required to produce the answer to the question or questions. Okay, so we have now our forms. So let's make a note of our forms as we go as well. So the respondent has seven days within the date of receiving a copy of the original aid application to enter an appearance. So the notice of appearance is form D. And in that form, you would include the respondent's full name and address and whether or not they intend to defend um, the application. So who would be a defendant in an instance where I am as an employee of made an application? The employee. Who's the respondent? Right, the respondent. So if you don't wish to enter an appearance or you may not want to participate in the proceedings, um, if you don't enter an appearance, you may not, you will not be able to participate in the proceedings unless you make an application for an extension to enter an appearance under rule 14. Or they may make an application under section 1A of the industrial rules to act or if they're acting as a witness in the proceedings. The secretary will send a notice of appearance made by the respondent to the applicant upon receipt of the notice from the respondent. If you intend to defend the application as the respondent, you would now file Form E. So Form E would be your defense. Got that? Mm -hmm. And that's um, filed, that's um, within 14 days of entering your parents. So we're looking at the timeline here, right? So continue following the timeline. We'll go to our timeline. Thereafter, under Section 7, the, we said that the tribunal may ask for further and better particulars from the respondent, and that is Form F. With this is what we talk about. Form B was what? Form B was. Notice of a parent? No, notice of a parent is Form D. Form You're saying B. Form, form B. B. Oh, sorry. Right, as a boy. Uh, that is... That's the further particulars of the applicant. Yes. The original application. Yes. And yes. So, form, so form F is the further particulars of the respondent. Okay? So you're getting the forms, right? But form A was? The originating application. Excellent. And so form E, what form E was? E? E as in Edward? So it is to defend of the applicant. Yes. Your defense. So your defense, excellent. So now we have form G. What form G is? Form G is an application um, for the requirement of the attendance of any party including a party as a witness. So this is where they would now require someone to attend the tribunal hearing. So they're requiring the attendance of a party or for a witness and production of requested documents. Then we have form H. Form H is what? The written answer to any question, if it considers the answer, may be clarity to an issue. Right. So we have now form H, which now they would have where you have a written answer where a question was asked that needs to be clarified. And then what you can do to vary or set aside the requirement under form one, which you'll do. What you're going to do with form one, you vary or set and decide what? Mm -hmm. Time to produce the answer to the question that was asked. So you may ask it to be varied or set aside. The question that's been asked on, under form H, we can fill out a form one of the schedule. 
before the time required to produce the answer to very well set aside the requirement of answering the question. So you see, we only do in the forms. We only need to know the timeline involved, what is to be included in the forms, and the house, the whole industrial procedure rules set up. So we know form A to form A so far, right? Any questions? So okay. Fun. Oh, so someone could do 10 to 17 for me, please. I can read 10 to 17. Thank you. Thank you, um, Kendra. And Ms. Servos. The secretary will furnish a copy of the requirement for a written answer and the answer to each party to the proceedings. Section 77 of the Industrial Tribunal Rules states that if a requirement under paragraph one or three is not complied with, a, tri a tribunal before or at the hearing may strike out the whole or part of the originating application or as the case may be of the notice of appearance and where appropriate direct that, that a respondent shall be debarred from defending altogether. The judge sets the date, time, and place of the hearing, sorry, it's number 12, and the secretary sends the notice of hearing to the parties to the proceedings in the prescribed form J of the schedule, together with information and guidance relating to the attendance at the hearing, witnesses, the production of documents, representation by another person, and making written representations. Number 13. The secretary is required to send the notice of hearing to the parties to the proceedings 14 days before the date fixed for the hearing, unless the secretary has agreed a shorter time with the parties. Number 14, the tribunal has the power and ability to determine any issue relating to entitlement of any party to bring or contest the proceedings on application of a party or of its own motion but only if the secretary has sent a notice to the parties giving them an opportunity to submit written representations and to make oral arguments before the tribunal. Number 15, any hearing of an originating application must be heard by a tribunal composed under, under the provisions of section 54 or 56 of the Industrial Relations Act and is normally open to the public unless required to be heard in private by the Minister of Labor due to issues of national security. That's in section 10.2 of the Industrial Relations Rules. Section 10.3 states that, notwithstanding paragraph two, a tribunal may sit in private for the purpose of A, hearing evidence which in the opinion of the tribunal relates to matters of such a nature that it would be against the interest of national security to allow the evidence to be given in public or B, hearing evidence from any person which in the opinion of the tribunal is likely to consist of, one, information which he could not disclose without contravening a pro prohibition imposed by or under any written law, or two, any information which has been communicated to him in confidence or which he has otherwise obtained in consequence of the confidence reposed in him by another person. Number 16. Although the decision of the tribunal may be made orally at the end of the hearing, it should be recorded in a document signed by the judge. Number 17, the tribunal should give reasons for its decisions in a document signed by the judge and where an award of compensation is made, the document should contain the amount of compensation followed by either, followed either by a table showing how the amount was calculated or a written description of the calculation. Okay, so we have now where the secretary will furnish a copy of the written of the requirement for a written answer, a set out in form H, and the answer to each party of the proceedings. And where section where paragraph one or three under section seven seven of the industrial tribunal rules, where sec, where paragraph one or three is not complied with a tribunal before at the hearing may strike out 
the whole or part of the originating application, or as the case may be where the notice of appearance is being filed, that the respondent shall be debarred from defending altogether where they have not complied with what they're supposed to do, what they would not have complied with, would we say? What they may not have complied with, where we had asked them to fit in accordance with Form B, you had to do what? Or... You had to give us put, um, better particulars? Yeah. And if you didn't do it, would the they have the power to do what? Strike, strike out. It. Strike it out. Right, and where you have not in accordance with Form D entered an appearance and you've not asked for an extension, or made an application under seven one. What we can do again? Strike it out. Barred from defending. Yes, excellent. So that's where that's what section seven seven deals with. Okay. So form J is the notice of hearing, and the notice of hearing is by the judge, which would now set out the time, the day, time, and place of the hearing, and it will give you guidance as to what is going to happen at the hearing and what witnesses should be, who are the witnesses, what documents should be produced, who's representing and who's making written representations. This is now the notice of hearing will be sent out by the secretary to the parties 14 days before the date fixed for the hearing unless the secretary has agreed um, to a shorter time in sending this out with the parties. The tribunal also has the power and ability to determine any issue relating to the entitlement of any party to bring proceedings, but only if the secretary has sent the notice to the parties, giving them an opportunity to submit written representations and to make all arguments before the tribunal. So they said the originated, originating application may be heard by a tribunal which is composed under section 54 or 56 of the Industrial Relations Act, and it's open to the public unless there, um, it has been determined by um, the Minister of Labor that um, there's issues of national security that um, should not be open to the public um, to be heard. So we have section 10.3, which deals with that, where they would, um, Close hearings where it's matters related to national um, security or where um, there's prohibition of information, which will likely um, impose some, will, I guess, contravene some laws or um, may give information that's sensitive um, to the public to be communicated therein. So even if it's something of a confidential nature that should not be open to um, public, for the public consumption, they um, under section 10, two, 10 3 of the um, industrial relations um, rules, we may now have it um, the matter heard in private. So otherwise, this is a public um, proceeding that can, that's the public can sit in and hear um, whatever um, information or is um, the hearing is out in the public domain, more or less. Once the decision is made, it should be recorded in a document and signed by a judge. Now, this is important because we may want to, there may be a decision made and I need it to be enforced because the other party is not adhering to the order or award and I want to get it enforced. I need some document to take with me to the Supreme Court to file for the enforcement of the award. Again, um, this document or um, order should include the reasons for my for the decision and where compensation is made. It should contain the amount of the compensation and it should be followed either by a table showing how I arrived at the amount, how it was calculated or a written description of how um, the amount was calculated. So if I gave you um, $100 a month, it should be 100 times 12. And the reason why I came to that decision should be above that and then showing how I um, made the award of compensation because it should be able to be um, followed by someone else 
who now has to enforce the order to see if it was calculated correctly or if it's subject to appeal, they will see where the errors were made. And import, most importantly, it should be signed by the judge. Any questions? Everyone understand so far? We follow in the process. Hi, Ms. Dorset. Yeah. I have questions, please. Go ahead. Um, my first question is relating to um, having the matter heard in private. Mm -hmm. does, the decision, does that decision originate from the tribunal or is an application made to have the hearing heard in private? Okay, so in order for it to in order for the tribunal, because of course the tribunal is a stranger to whomever is before it. So in order for us to say that this matter is subject to issues of national security or it's um, confidential matters that should not be in the public domain, the parties to the action must bring this to the attention of the tribunal and they may now make the decision based on 10.3 or 10.2. Okay. So that has to be brought to their attention for them to make that decision, because otherwise I won't know until we get into the depth of the matter that, oh, this should not even have been out here, eh? Yeah. Because we won't make that decision outright. If I'm, especially national security, they may have some idea or they may not even know that this would affect national security based on how it came about. But um, if it's brought to the attention, by the employer or employee or whomever is before it, then they can make that decision before the matter is out in the public domain. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and this could include things like um, trade secrets or company like KFCs. In particular, press. right. Okay. So they'll say, well, no, this can't be out here or based on what information is being um, given, this cannot be in a public document in particular. So they may have... Um, they may dispute or they may um, be against you putting some information out in um, in written form. They may say no. Um, we uh, so in some instances when you go to court, you have discretion discretionary statements where you'll say, well, I only want the judge to be able to see this. I don't want this to be a part of the record for anybody to go on the record and be able to look at this because this will affect my company in the future. Or this is trade secrets this intellectual property that should not be out there, stuff of that nature. So again, it's an application by whomever is affected to make sure that the tribunal is aware. Okay. Um, I had another question regarding the enforce, if you, if you need to enforce in the Supreme Court. Right. Um, if you have to take it to the Supreme Court, are you, are you, um, restricted to try and get enforcement for what you were awarded in the tribunal? Because I mean, it's a case where you now have the inconvenience of having to obtain counsel to go to the Supreme Court. Well, I mean, once you, and you know, course follows the action. Okay. So if I go to court, automatically whatever course I incur now follows. So if I have to go to court and they hold that the award has to be enforced, automatically the cost is on the party who is at fault. Okay. So that's Nine a part damages. of your right. So you would now so in a, in addition to that, I want interest from the date that I should have received it to this point. Okay. I want cost for me coming here, all my application fees, all of that stuff. Okay. So you can't get them. I know you can't get damages at the trade tribunal level. Are you now able to get damages for the inconvenience of having to now go to the Supreme Court? I don't know because that would be a different application. Mm, okay. So you only enforce it more or less. So now you only can ask for what what you should have received to put this okay. point. Okay. And hopefully you would have gotten some interest to that point um, that the the, the um, tribunal would have awarded interest. And okay. if they've awarded interest, then you can enforce that interest amount as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, 18 to 20, no, 23. Let's see how we can hit that off. Okay, I'll go. Thank you. The secretary is required to keep a register at the industrial tribunal 
and place the documents of the tribunal's decision and any document relating to the award of compensation in the register, which should be open for public inspection and entry of the decision and or documents should be sent to the parties to the proceedings and the Minister of Labor. However, entries may be omitted from the register where the minister has directed that the tribunal sit in private or on grounds of national security or where evidence has been heard in private and the tribunal so directs. Clerical mistakes or error may be corrected by a certificate assigned by the judge after which the secretary may make the necessary alterations slash corrections in accordance with the certificate and send copies of the amended entries to each party to the proceedings and the Minister of Labor. Likewise, the same procedure applies for omitted documents where such omission is made in error. Where the judges, where the judges are unable to sign due to death, incapacity or unable to sign, the certificate correcting the errors and omissions due to death or incapacity the certificate may be signed by any other member of the tribunal certifying that the judge having carriage of the matter is unable to sign. Rule 11, 9. 19, the tribunal has the following miscellaneous powers under Rule 12, 1. A, if the applicant at any time gives notice of the withdrawal of his originating application in form K in the schedule, dismiss the proceedings. B, if both or all, all, if both or all the parties agree in writing upon the terms of a decision to be made by the tribunal, decide accordingly. C, consider representations in writing which have been submitted by a party to the secretary pursuant to rule 3.5 and rule 3.6 less than seven days before the hearing. D, at any stage of the proceedings, order to be, to be struck out or amended any notice of appearance or defense on the grounds that it is scandalous, frivolous, or vexatious. vexatious. E, at any stage of the proceedings, order to be struck out any originating application notice of appearance or defense on the grounds that the manner in which the proceedings have been conducted by or on behalf of the applicant, or as the case may be, the respondent has been scandalous, frivolous, or vexatious. And F, on the application of the respondent or of its own motion or an originating application to be struck out for want of prosecution. A tribunal may, before determining an application under Rule 7 or Rule 16, require the party making the application to give notice of it to every party. And such notice shall give particulars to the application and indicate the address to which the time within which any objection to the application shall be made. Being an address and time spe specified for the purposes of the application by the tribunal, the judge may postpone the day or time fixed for or adjourn any hearing and vary such postponement or adjournment. Any function of the secretary may be formed by a person acting with the authority of the secretary. 20, in any case involving allegations of the sexual misconduct, the judge before a decision is made either on application by the party made by notice to the secretary or of its own motion, make a restricted, restricted reporting order. When a restricted reporting order is made, it, is, it must specify in the order the persons who may not be identified and that the order will remain in force until the decision is made or earlier if it is revoked. The secretary is required to post a notice of the restricted order and its conditions on the notice board of the tribunal and the door of the proceedings relating to the order. 21, the tribunal may extend the time for any procedural action required under the industrial tribunal rules upon application by a party of its own motion. The application of 
the application for an extension of time should be made in the prosecution form L of the schedule of, of the schedule to the secretary <coughs> and settled the title proceedings. And <coughs> Well, to the secretary and settled the little and settled the title of the proceedings and particulars of the grounds for requesting an extension of time. The secretary must send copies of the notice of extension of time to all parties to the proceedings. 22, the tribunal may give directions on any matter in connection with or related to the proceedings before it on application by a part or of its own motion. A notice of application must be made to the secretary to request directions to be given by the tribunal and shall contain the title of the proceedings and particulars of the grounds of the application for directions, form M. The tribunal also has the power to join parties to or dismiss parties from a proceeding who appears to the tribunal to not have been or has ceased to be directly interested in the proceedings on application of any person to the proceedings or of its own motion. Once application is made to the secretary to do so, it may also make consequential decisions based upon joined or the dismissal of a party of the proceedings, T. Okay, so we have the tribunal in the case of, just so I'll be sure, we started off at 19 or we started off at 20? 19. 19. So the tribunal has miscellaneous um, powers under rule 12, one, and they include the, um, where the um, applicant has, submitted form K for withdrawal of the originated application. Um, the tribunal can dismiss the proceedings if both or all parties agree in writing um, um, for a decision of the tribunal to be made. The tribunal would decide accordingly. So that's a consent of all parties there. So it's more or less a consent order. Um, they may consider representations in writing that have been made less than the seven days required before the hearing, they have that power to consider the representations notwithstanding they're outside of the time limit for um, presenting those um, written representations to the tribunal. They may at any stage of the proceeding strike out or amend any notice of appearance or defense. Um, so they can order that it be struck out on the grounds that it's scandalous frivolous or vexatious. So you just may, it may not um, be worth having on their record. It's, it presents, it tries to present someone in a different light or it's just um, frustrating to the whole process. Um, at any stage of the proceedings, they may order the originating application or notice of appearance or defense on the grounds that um, it'll be strike out on the grounds that the manner in which the proceedings are being conducted by or on behalf of the applicant, or as the case may be, the respondent has been scandalous, frivolous, or vexatious. And on the application of the respondent or on the or of its own motion on behalf of the tribunal, order that an originating application be struck out for want of prosecution. So that means that. Um, the applicant has filed um, their originating application, but they have not done anything more. So basically 
um, they just hold in this process. I'll call somebody in court in limbo and they're not intending to proceed. So we strike it out for them not proceeding to prosecute the matter. Um, before determining an application under seven or um, rule seven or 16, they shall, uh, they can ask the um, party making the application to give notice to the other party and that the particular, and they should give particulars of the application, um, indicate the address to which and the time within which an ob objection to the application shall be made. So they have to put all those things in place and the judge may postpone the day or time fixed for or join any hearing and vary such postponement or adjournment thereafter. Um, the function of the secretary may be performed by any person acting with the authority of the secretary where there's um, allegations of sexual misconduct, the judge, um, before the decision is made, may order a restricting reporting order. And this is where they will not identify the party. They would put that the order should not include or identify the party um, in these um, allegations, in sexual allegation cases. Uh, in the order uh, until such order, restricted reporting order is revoked. And they will put this notice so that all parties involved will know that there's a restricted order and the conditions of the restriction on the notice board of the tribunal and the door of the proceedings where the order has now been given. So that everybody who's a party to the proceedings will know that this um, should not be out in the public domain. There's restriction on how you would discuss the matter. Then we have um, an extension of time. You can now apply for an extension of time in form L. That's form L extension of time. And you should include the grounds why you're requesting an extension of time for consideration. And once you would have um, sent that on, the secretary will send a notice of extension of time to all the parties to the proceedings. Then we have form M where you're requesting directions of the tribunal. And so it will be made to the secretary asking for directions in connection with any matter or um, relate, connected with or relating to the proceedings before the tribunal. So that's form N. The, the tribunal also has the power to join parties or to dismiss parties from a proceeding again, where somebody may say, I should not have been a party to these proceedings. They give um, plausible reasons as to why the tribunal may decide to um, dismiss them from the proceedings, or they can join parties to proceedings where they feel that they should be a party to the proceedings where we say in that instance where um, someone was acting on the authority of someone in a company based on them, given their own personal guarantees, they should be joined as a party and should be a party to paying or um, the applicant where there is some compensation to be made. Any questions? Okay, let's I'm sorry, Ms. Fawcett, I have a question, please. Oh, go ahead. Um, regarding an originating application that you want to have struck out for want of prosecution. Right. Is there a time frame um, in which uh, you have to, I guess, progress the matter? Like how you have in the Supreme Court, if you were to file a writ and you have a time frame in which to file your statement of claim, if you won't do it within that period of time, you can apply to have it struck out. Right. So now we the have time time. Frame? Right. So we have time frames in, involved, right? Where we started out, remember I say, well, let's pay attention to our timelines. So now you have, what when you start out the application, you have 14 days after referral from the Minister of Labor to file your originating application. Right. Where the president now may say you have not given enough particulars, you have 14 days to furnish the particulars from the date on which you were um, directed to do so. Mm -hmm. Now, you, if you have not furnished that, what happens there? We can now what? You can have the matter dismissed. Struck out, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have not complied and you are yes, not proceeded. So, right, so we have as early as that 
portion to so now. 28 so days. Okay. We are right. If if it's 28 days, because it may just be the 14 days. If you've not come back to me, then I still have time because now you have to file your defense and all of that stuff. But right. if I've done everything that I'm supposed to do, or if I've not done what I was supposed to do, then I can now ask for it to be struck out or the tribunal of its own volition may now strike it out. So at okay. any point where these timelines are not followed, we can now say strike it out for one of prosecution. Okay. You okay. see? All right. Okay. Yes. Um, I have a All question right. on the, the sexual misconduct. Right. Um, if that comes up in a tribunal matter. It, at what point would there could there be a decision that the matter is criminal or otherwise that would fall out of the jurisdiction of the tribunal? Okay, so in where there's allegations of sexual misconduct, you know, you would have a criminal side and a civil side. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yes. where there was some criminal activity involved, that's a different side of. You remember, we only dealing with civil. We dealing with the civil side of things here. So any criminal um, liability or action should have been taken somewhere else. Okay, so this would be an additional step that a respondent could take for right. satisfaction right. So, of the Right, thing. so I'm now suing my workplace based on sexual misconduct or allegations of sexual misconduct that I may have been exposed to. And my case okay. will be bolstered by the criminal um, liability that may have been found um, in the magistrate or Supreme Court to say that this person actually had um, um, committed some sexual um, acts against me. So that's like in a traffic case, I was in an accident. First of all, the traffic, um, the, you have to go to traffic court and be found liable, eh? mm -hmm. because it helps your civil case if you now go after the person for um, damages or okay. you see, so you need, you usually need that, that criminal case to bolster your civil case because then they have no dispute there. They can't say, well, I am not at fault because you've already been found criminally negligent, you see? Okay. So that's what it usually happens. So they, do, they don't have jurisdiction. One don't have jurisdiction. So the civil court don't have jurisdiction over the civil uh, the criminal court. Okay. So you usually um, deal with those in separate instances. And deal with criminal first to support the civil case. Right. So I, I can run the, on the same track or I should usually wait till the criminal, um, till he's found criminally liable and then I can move on to the civil one. Okay. But in you. the meantime, you'd want to um, preserve your time just to say I, I have this matter going on down there and I'm waiting for the decision, but I wanted to put it in in the meantime. Okay, so that's where you fill out form L. Right, so I can ask for what that is, what form L is, so everyone will know. Application mm -hmm. for an extension. Yeah, so we may ask for an extension of time because we may need further evidence from something and we give the grounds why we request an extension of time, eh? Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's move on to who's going to read now for 24. We're going to carry it home. It's a short read. I'll go. Thank you. The tribunal may combine proceedings under certain conditions specified in Rule 17 of the Industrial Relations Rule Form N, number 25. With regards to notices, Rule 18 requires the following procedure. One, any notice given under these rules shall be in writing. Two, all notices and documents required by these rules to be presented to the secretary may be presented at the office of the industrial tribunal or such other office as may be notified by the secretary to the parties. Three, all notices and documents required or authorized by these rules to be sent or given to any person here and after mentioned may be sent by post subject to paragraph five or delivered to or at a in the case of a notice or document directed to a party, the address specified in his originating application or notice of appearance to which notices and documents are to be sent or in a notice under paragraph four or to if not 
If no such address has been specified, or if a notice sent to such an address has been returned to any other new address or place of business in the Bahamas, or if the party is a corporate body, the body is registered or principal office in the Bahamas, or in any case, such address or place outside the Bahamas as the chairman may allow or be, in the case of a notice or document directed to any person other than a party to the proceedings, his address or place of business in the Bahamas, or if the person is a corporate body, the body is registered or principal office in the Bahamas, and a notice or document sent or given to the authorized representative of a party shall be deemed to have been sent or given to that party. Four, a party may at any time by notice to the secretary in form P in the schedule and to the other party or parties change the address to which notices and documents are to, to be sent to him. Five, the registered postal service shall be used instead of the ordinary post when a second set of notices or documents is sent to a respondent who has not entered an appearance under rule 5.1 and for the service of an order made under rule 7.2. Six, the judge may direct that there shall be substituted service in such manner as he may deem fit in any case he considers appropriate. Okay, so we have form N where the tribunal may combine proceedings. So the um, form N deals with combining proceedings under certain conditions as specified in rule 17 and rule 18 deals with notices. So rule 18 says notices under these rules. So notices and documents required to be presented to the secretary may be presented at the office of the tribunal and such other office as the secretary may notify to the parties. All notices and documents required or authorized by these rules may be sent or given to a person here and after mentioned, may be sent by post subject to paragraph five or delivered to or at, in the case of a notice or document directed to the party to their address, whereas the company to the registered office, the last known address, and where we don't have um, the parties where we are unable to get the document served on the parties or the address is insufficient and it's returned, we can now um, request the judge, let them know we can't find the person and they may give us an order for substituted service, which means that um, substituted service could be we publish it in the post um, I mean, publish it in the newspaper or by social media or whatever means necessary so that it would be said that it was out in the, gen in the general public and they had sufficient time to read the notice. Okay. Um, they can do change of address. Um, and that's form P. They can now uh, um, advise of their change of address where parties have changed their address in order for notices to be sent, okay? So we've dealt with the combination of the proceedings and rule 18 deals with our notices. Now, our administrative structure of the industrial tribunal, again, I'm gonna ask um, that we get that information for next week. I want you to fill this information out where we have the president, the vice president, um, tell me which one is in Freeport, if we have one there. And then you can give me who's the secretary um, to the um, tribunal and um, the assistant secretary of any. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Yes, it is. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Let's answer our questions quickly. Explain the distinguishing characteristics of a quasi judicial process. What are they? We will find that answer first. Page 23. Page 23. And what is that? Um, the administrative tribunals today. I got it. I think I got it. Oh. The industrial relations tribunals and the employment tribunals. So tell me what the what we what we asking for. What is the characteristics? What is this distinguished character distinguishing characteristics? What are the distinguishing characteristics? 
the process is less fun. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. And the standard of proof is on the balance of probabilities. Which is? They were which is a lesser, but at a lesser standard in terms of proving a case against the defending party. So it's a less formal judicial process in terms of evidence and standard of proof for legal matters. And then unlike in the civil matters and criminal matters, where it's beyond a reasonable doubt or civil matters on the balance of probabilities, the process is on the standard of proof on the balance of probabilities, a lesser standard in terms of proving a case. So that's the difference in the process. What is the composition of the industrial tribunal? Where we'll find that? 25. Page 25. What is the composition? Three, three members. President, uh -huh. two vice presidents. Vice president, secretary. What is the composition? Say it again. Three members, including a president and two vice presidents, one in Nassau, one in Freeport. And how are they appointed? By the governor general. On, on, on the, the advice, advice of the Judicial and Legal Service Commission. Excellent. Now, what is the jurisdiction of the Industrial Tribunal? Well, I'll find that answer. Page 26. Page 26. Okay, what is the jurisdiction? To, to the generally has and determined trade disputes referred to it by the labor board or directly aggrieved applicant. Uh huh. What else? Oh, um, registers industrial agreements and adjudicates matters relating to the registration of industrial agreements, although it may here and adjudicate other matters under the purview of the Industrial Relations Act. Excellent. What are the powers of the industrial tribunal? Well, I'll find that answer. Page 28. Page 28. Okay. What are their powers? That's um one through ten. One through ten. Okay. Ten. One through ten. Give me two powers just so we'll remember. Here and adjudicate any question which may arise in relation to a trade dispute in the absence of any party who has been summoned to appear before the tribunal and has failed to do so. Okay. Give directions regarding the hearing or determination of a trade dispute. Excellent. What is the procedure for commencing a trade dispute in the industrial tribunal? Page I'll find that answer. Page 29. Page 29. And how would I commence it? We go from one to what? How we come how we commence a trade dispute? Go from one to 25. One to 25. How it's commenced. How we could commence it. Though. Give me the commencements. You can one to three. One to three. So give me just an example of the starting. One to three. How you started? Right. Through the labor board by um, creating an origination or an originating application. Right. So, uh, what that originating application is? Form what? Um, Form, A. A. Form A. Okay. When is a restricted reporting order normally made? Where we'll find that? Page. Um, that's the second one. National Security. Oh, um, 33. Page. Page 33. And then is that usually made? In sex matters. Mm -hmm. Allegations of sex. So modest, involving, to be. involving allegations of sexual misconduct, eh? Right, yes. yes. Okay. And it's usually made when? At the beginning. Right. right. Okay, what, in what circumstances may an entry not be made public in the register? Where we'll find that answer. On page 33, eh? Page 33. 32. Page 32. What page 32 tells us? National Security. Any hearing of an originating application must be heard by a tribunal composed under the provisions of Section 54 or 56 of the Industrial Relations Act 
and is normally open to the public unless required to be heard in private by the Minister of Labor due to issues of national security. Okay, it's 32. So what they say, what they telling me? Matters related to national security can be private. Hearing evidence in which, in the opinion, the tribunal relates to matters of such nature, but be against the interests of national security, could so not be disclosed without contravening a prohibition imposed by or under any written law. Okay, yeah, hearing and evidence from, yeah, not standing paragraph two. Yeah. So they what they'll do with that? Where they say, tell me, y'all still didn't get to it. Look at number 18. The key there, yeah. okay, relating to. It would be omitted from the register where the minister has directed that the tribunal sit in private on grounds of national security. It'll be omitted from the register. Where it has been directed by whom? The minister. Or where? Sorry? Or, or where or, evidence has been heard in private and the tribunal so directs. Okay, so that's where we'll put that on, so okay? Yes. So that's page 32 at point 18, eh? Correct. Okay. What must be done if an error or omission is made in the document where the decision is recorded? What happens there? Where we'll find that answer? 32. Page 32, what happens? Mistakes. Uh, mistakes. Sign it. Corrected by a certificate signed uh -huh. by the judge, uh -huh. after which the secretary may make the, the necessary alterations, corrections, in accordance with the certificate and send copies to the minister. Excellent. Okay, when, a, when may a, a tribunal combine proceedings? Page 34. Page mm -hmm. 34, uh-huh. Um, when we'll make it under certain conditions specified in Rule 17. And that's your rule for men. Okay, so that's for men, and it's under conditions specified in Rule 17 of the Industrial Relations Rule. Relations what rule. is the procedure regarding notices to individuals and companies? What is the procedure? We're able to find that answer. It's 34. Uh huh. Five. What is it for notices for individuals? It must be in writing. What, so we deliver it where? 25. Is it 25, A? Eh? Tell me, tell me, tell me. In the case of a notice or document directed to a party. So first one, of all, the notice must be in what? Writing. It shall be in writing. Okay. And then it must do what? Present to the secretary. Present to the secretary. Uh-huh. At the office of the tribunal. Okay. And then what else? It must be sent or given to any person. Mentioned. By, mentioned. Mentioned. Right? By, by what? Post, by post uh -huh. or delivered personally to them at the address. The which address application right or notice of appearance to which documents on in the case of a company where we'll send it to the registered address to the registered address yes yes principal office in the bahamas okay all right so that was a big one to digest eh? we know the industrial tribunal and employment tribunal yes Yes. We have uh, a awareness. Lot. Okay, we have an awareness and appreciation of the quasi judicial and the process. Yes. Yes, or you're just saying yes, right? So yes, no, yes. it's it's very interesting <laughs> indeed. Okay, good. <laughs> we have an in-depth knowledge of the rules and procedures of the Bahamas Industrial Tribunal. We should be able to go from A to N or yes. Um, we can go right straight to all the forms now. Eh? We we know yes. the rules and procedures. We know the timelines. 
We know how to combine. Who's going to combine proceedings? I saw the judge. The judge. The judge. Excellent. We know the workings of the Bahamas Industrial Tribunal. Yes. What happens when we don't file in time? What they may do? Strike it out. Right. Yeah. Unless we ask for an extension. Extension. extension extension of time and when we ask for extension of time would we have to give in order for them to consider it mm -hmm. our grounds why we need this extension eh? yeah um what about the appeals process for appeals to the supreme court and court of appeal from the, the from the industrial tribunal that's where we appeal yes we will appeal we can appeal to the supreme court or further to court the court of appeal and where can we enforce orders the Supreme Court. Can the Industrial Tribunal enforce its own orders? No. Okay. And when we go to the Supreme Court, we should get our course for now having to enforce our order. Eh? Yes. And, and any interest that may have been awarded. Okay. So we have some homework. We need to know who's the what? Who makes up the Vice President? And and the Vice President. Okay. So. So we have that as a part of our homework, eh? Mm. And then I will send you a case out of here, just so you all have some reading, okay? Yes. Any questions? Miss Miss Dorset. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't have my email. Okay, let me write it down now. You want to send it in the chat so I don't write it wrong? Yes, ma'am, I'll send it. Okay, send it right now for me, please. Thank you. Thank you too. I have everybody on the register. Let me make sure. I called everyone's name, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I see someone as P. Farkas, and I don't have that person. Okay. That's Paul Farkasson from our office. Okay, let me write Sorry. that. Down. Cherry. Cherry. P. Farkasson. Okay. Yeah, I, I, sent, I sent the email um, to you directly. <laughs> Okay, let me put you, the, I, you got any emails from me, Mr. Farkasen? No, I, I did not. Okay, I'll write all of you down. I'll send you the email I sent out earlier, um, at least yesterday, so y'all will have that one. All right, thank you very much. Thank you too. Uh, okay. I joined late. Okay, let me write you down. Who's that, who joined late? Laura Stewart. Laura Stewart. Yes, ma'am. Let me see. Why have you? I don't have you. You want me if to send you, 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 you got any emails from me? No, ma'am. Okay, yeah. Send me your email quickly yeah? before we close the chat. I'll be able to see it. I have everybody else got the emails, right? Yes. Yes, I did. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All righty then. So I will see. Uh -huh. so I, all of the cases that's noted in the study resource guide, are we required to know all of these cases? No, no. It's just um, helpful in you explaining any questions. It usually helps you out in understanding the topic even better as well, because it's more or less, you know, the cases present a little story. Yeah. And so Usually, I was just, I was just wondering. Yeah, so she coming, you know, what time is she coming? Unless you have access to um, like a Lexus. Some of, Lexus. Right. I'll try to. I usually try to. And even if it ain't ringing through, just stay there and listen. It'll, it'll, she'll answer. Okay. I will usually try to send you some um resources as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. No problem. Yes. Yes. I'm um, just confirming the homework is the um, administrative structure of the industrial tribunal. Right. You're going to get that for me. Yes, ma'am. And we'll discuss that. Um, we'll just have that in our box. You see, it's easier for you. You should know it anyway. 2212 at Gmail. Okay. I think I have everybody's. So all who send me emails didn't get an email from me. So I'll send you emails. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And I'll send you some additional resources for this week's class as well. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. And I will see you guys next week, God's willing. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. Too. Okay, thank thank you. you. Mm.
Okay. I got to see what I'm going to do. Uh, okay. That's right, don't forward me. 